Great. Thank you very Indeed, much. Yeah. So <clears throat> you listen to the governor and um, you have done an, an analysis of his entire statement um, here on, on Joy News. Our team at PM Express have done their own analysis, found certain inaccuracies and certain discrepancies as far as the statement that he made are concerned <clears throat> in respect of the figures and even in respect of the uh, headquarters building that he was talking about as to the time they started it and with hindsight, they would not have started it. We'll share that with you shortly. But let's begin with you, Bright. What has been your review of his presentation? What are the problems with the justifications that he offered? They sound really, you know, reasonable, aren't they? Uh, thank you, Samson. So, yes, um, an, a group of Imani analysts, um, once we received the invitation from your production team, have been pouring over um, the data that was presented, the information that was presented. And I'm going to do a quick summary of their findings. I hope that is fine. That's fine. Okay, so if they can project my um, slides onto the screen. It's being projected. Start... Please proceed. Okay, thank you so much. So as you know, we've had um, some background with the Bank of Ghana in terms of some of its policy mistakes. That's not what we are discussing today, but it's important that we put it uh, into context that some of us in civil society have been trying to get attention, the attention of the nation about some of the policies that the Bank of Ghana has been pursuing over the last couple of years, which are not always very sound, like the forced recapitalization of banks, um, where they force banks to dramatically increase um, stated capital, whereas, in fact, it was capital adequacy that was a challenge, as we saw. Some of the biggest banks in the country were the ones that went down. And when time came to, it wasn't the smaller banks, actually, that had the problem. So given that fact, we were not that surprised when eventually the country kind of caught up with some of the things that we've been saying for a long time. Um, as far as the central bank is concerned. But I'll now go to the issues that are for discussion today. There are two major parts to this. One is, of course, the losses that it announced in its annual report for 2022. And then the second one is some of the specific projects that um, have then, in the course of the discussion, have come up, particularly the issue of the procurement um, concerns surrounding the, 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 the headquarters um, um, project. So starting with the losses, the, you know, the balance sheet losses that we've been discussing all along, we have to admit that central banks do make losses. It's not entirely um, um, impossible that a central bank will make a loss in a year. The way in which a central bank might make losses is traditionally in about three forms. One is, as we've discussed, capital and valuation losses. The central bank has some assets. Some of those assets can include government securities, like the bonds that they were holding, uh, the government of Ghana bonds. And if there is any development that requires you to revalue those assets, you have to recognize it in your profit and loss statement because it passes through. So there are ways in which, because the central bank holds assets and those assets could be revalued, losses could accrue. So that's true. The central bank in some countries are also very developmental, like in Nigeria, and they give subsidies and pro, you know they give money to various um, business actors in the economy, and they could lose money through that effort as well. And then lastly, their operational expenses, like we are seeing now with some of the challenges that have come up um, with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the headquarters project, et cetera, et cetera. But more critically, the operational expenses that are of interest tend to be the ones that are connected to monetary policy. So, for instance, the Bank of Ghana tries to maintain the currency value and things like that. And doing so, it uh, conducts what is normally called quantitative easing and other such activities. If there are changes in the market, like interest rates change and things like that, or their interest income is not uh, rises because of general rising of interest rates, so they have to pay more to the banks for the assets that the banks hold to them, or for any of those kind of reasons, a central bank can also make losses. So that is not in dispute. The second issue, which is very critical, is that we have to pay attention to two key factors when it comes to these losses. What is the scale of the losses and why? So our analysis is based on these two issues. How big are the losses 
compared to other losses in other central banks in other parts of the world? And what were the causes? To us, if we want to assign blame to the Bank of Ghana, that is where we need to look. How bad were the losses and why did the losses emanate? So you look at some countries that in the past have had losses, especially in the 90s, for various reasons, and the IMF tracks this. And you see that generally the losses can be computed as a percentage of different numbers that makes the put the loss in perspective. So one way you can look at the loss is that, okay, what is the percentage of the loss, um, what is the, uh, the, the size of the loss as a percentage of that bank, of that central bank's equity? You can also look at it as a percentage of the government's expenditure. If you look at it that way, the Bank of Ghana losses are incredible. So for instance, uh, as a percentage of expenditures in Ghana, they were roughly 35% of exchanges of the prior year. So that's a huge amount compared to, as you can see on the screen, uh, Brazil, 1.5%, Czech Republic, 1.8%, Thailand, 7.7%, etc. So to have a 35%, uh, to have a loss, that is about 35% or one third of the expenditure of the government in the year before, the total expenditure of the year before, is dramatic. The other way is also to look at it in terms of equity. And there, it's even mind-boggling because the Bank of Ghana has such a tiny equity that when you express as a percentage, it makes no sense, like 600,000% or something like that. So we're not even going to go there. But in short, the Bank of Ghana's losses is so wild that it requires <coughs> better investigation than so far they've been willing to concede. You can also look at the central bank losses as a percentage of the gross domestic product, the country's total output, economic output in a year. And if you do that, and you do the benchmark, and the Bank of Ghana's attempt to suggest that these losses are ordinary or routine because other places are also making losses, all of a sudden makes no sense because the scale in other places compared to what we are seeing in the Bank of Ghana's case is dramatically different. So, for instance, the whole of the euro area, if you strike an average of what were the, were the losses that were encountered in, were experienced in recent times, you get something like 0.2% of gross domestic product or GDP. In the case of the Bank of Ghana, it's around 8%. So that is almost 40 times as high as what they saw in Europe. So in short, there is really very little uh, benefit in attempting to compare to other places when your losses are astronomical. When your losses are astronomical, you don't really start comparing to others. It's almost like saying that, okay, you know, somebody complains about, um, um, you know, the salary in, in a company. And then you say, but other companies also pay low salaries. Okay, how higher are their salary compared to, I say, 40 times more? That would make no sense. So that is really the way you have to look at it. Now we go into a little bit more detail and we find out that the Bank of Ghana's account can be broken down into four in terms of how, four layers, in terms of how these losses came about. First is the massive haircuts that they endured on bonds that they have, basically they bought a lot of government debt or they've given money to the government and those monies they've given to the government were to be paid back. So they are considered as assets. Now those assets, the government said that because the country is broke, they are going to cut half of it. So essentially, they're going to reduce the value of the asset by half. The, the loans that the Bank of Ghana had given to the government, which were assets on the Book of Ghana, were to be slashed in half, and they will reprofile the rest. They also acknowledge exchange rate losses, increase in their operational expenses, and then interest expense on their monetary policy operations. It's only the last excuse that usually most of the other laws we are seeing around the world um, aligns with. So essentially, when interest rates go up, it costs the bank, uh, the central banks more to also conduct monetary operations. So usually, almost all the laws that you are seeing around the world have come about because of those that particular reason. The other reasons that is given is very peculiar, and I will explain in a moment. Take exchange rate losses. The exchange rate is one of the functions of the central bank. One of the, 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 the primary tasks of the central bank is, is, is currency stability. So if through the central bank's effort, of course, the, the, the central government itself has a huge role to play in terms of fiscal policy. But its monetary stability is one of the key um, um, rules of the central bank. So if through that you make losses, you can't just simply wash your hands off it. So I will, I will not talk a lot about uh, exchange rate laws. I'll, talk, I'll focus primarily on the haircuts, and then I'll go into the operational expenses, which I will narrow down to the headquarters as an example of how its operational expenses are not very sound. When you decide that you're going to you know, go broke as a country, you're going to default on your debt, you have to take into account the fact that the central bank lends money to the government. So the central bank is a lender to the government. It's one of the creditors. 
because it's one of the creditors, its assets are also going to be hit, just like we've seen with all the investors and the rest of it. That's true. But the IMF warns that when it comes to the central bank, how you manage their situation during a debt restructuring is very important. And it has to be done with care and skill. So if you read, you carefully read the central bank's, uh, sorry, the IMF's guidance on how you do debt restructuring, and you compare it to how we did it in the case of the Bank of Ghana, that raised a lot of problems. And because the Bank of Ghana is independent and nothing could have been forced on it unless it had agreed, the question then arises why it accepted the approach that the government took. So let's look at case studies in other places where they've had a major debt restructuring and there's been an impact on the central bank and how they dealt with it. In the case of Greece, it was very straightforward. They said to the government that, well, we, this, these are assets and we are needed because of the fact that we have to have policy credibility. We can't just let you come in and destroy our asset base. So if you are going to do this debt restructuring and want us to play a role and help you to make your numbers look good, the IMF say bring it to 55%. You can't do it unless you slash our devaluation of our assets, which is the loans we are doing to you. Then you have to give us something back. And what the, the Greek government then was forced to do was to transfer title of some state-owned enterprise to the central bank that helped the central bank recalibrate its balance sheet. Barbados had a different approach, which was that they built the recapitalization into the program. So you, the cost of the recapitalization, because you are basically destroying the balance sheet of the central bank. So you or the government has to help to restore that balance sheet. In Ghana's case, they are saying they may do it in five years, but they've not budgeted for it in the program. So the way in which they decide, they intended to bring the, um, the debt down, the percentage of the debt, the debt as a percentage of GDP down to about 55%, they have not planned for the recapitalization. So it makes no sense in the way that they've described it. You look at the way the Greeks did it. It turns out that Greece, even when the country was collapsing, its economy was collapsing, and it had this massive debt crisis, the central bank in 2012, when that process was undertaken and the central bank took ahead, it still turned a profit, as you can see uh, on the screen. So Greece turned a profit during the period when restructuring was happening in Greece. I would say that their situation was even worse than ours, if you look at the, the, the data. In the case of uh, Barbados, it did turn a loss. But as I've explained, they did a number of things through recapitalization that prevented them from being the state that we are in where our central bank risks losing credibility. Because without some of those assets, which and the impact on their cash flow, it's not always clear that they have all the money that they need without uh, printing money to do some of the things that they have to do if the economy was to go to a still spin. So having a strong balance sheet as a central bank is an important anchor of your credibility. And the way that the Barbadians did it, uh, established that, to my mind, they paid strong attention to this policy credibility issue. Don't forget also that at the time that this was happening, director fees in Barbados, or the Central Bank of uh, Barbados directors, independent directors, that helps it run the board, was about $30,000. You know we've had a running battle with the Bank of Ghana in recent uh, days because we found out that director fees is almost $800,000. They say that also includes the cost of meetings and the cost of stationery and the rest of it. But that really doesn't make much of a difference. How much is a cost of a meeting or a cost of stationery? So really, if you think of Ghana having, you know, a country like Ghana spending almost 30 times on their board of directors compared to Barbados, it's not surprising that our losses will be worse because it appears as if the Bank of Ghana is profligate. That leads us back to the issue around uh, why they were buying so much bonds in the first place. Because part of what they were doing was they were, be, they were abetting loose fiscal policy. Instead of being independent and getting, you know, the government and licking the government to shape and saying, look, you can't just keep spending money you don't have. Every time these requests were coming in, they were just, you know, complying. And that is why it turning out that it appears they had hidden liabilities. Because you look at their own uh, records and they say that by the end of 2022, they had about 42 billion um, Ghana cities in government securities. And then when these issues of losses started to come, so this is, I'm taking this from the December 2022 data that we have. And just from September to January, when January 2023, September 2022 to January 2023, when the whole uh, um, re re restructuring exercise began, the Bank of Ghana appears to have doubled how much uh, government debt it was carrying. So it was reporting 42 billion at the end of September, 2022, by the time this happened, and now we are beginning to know that, you know, they had huge, this huge loss because they are giving the government so much money than, you know, the government itself could afford. It had jumped to 80 billion. So that's a massive jump. Accumulated debt of about 40 billion 
all of a sudden 80 billion. This kind of reckless lending to the government cannot be wished away. Particularly when by the time we're through, we're then beginning to realize that the Bank of Ghana then was holding almost 30 percent, if you look at the numbers, because the domestic debt was about 217 billion, as we were told. If the Bank of Ghana was holding 80 billion of it, you know, that's almost uh, 30 percent. Even if it was the 40, uh, 50 per billion or 60 billion that we've also seen in some of their numbers, the 60 billion seen in some of their numbers, that is almost 30 percent. You look at Kenya, and Kenyan Central Bank holds, uh, in terms of its share of domestic debt, it's about 2 percent. So when you have a central bank that becomes basically the wallet of the government, of a profligate government, if the government is spending, it's enabling that, that becomes problematic. Then also, in an attempt to justify why all of this has happened, the Bank of Ghana all of a sudden starts to use very misleading data in the statement that released to all of us, telling us that the Netherlands, for instance, um, and the, the Dutch Central Bank experienced losses that were up to 11% of GDP. When the numbers themselves, you know, when you look at the numbers in terms of estimated losses um, as a percent of GDP, you look at the GDP and you look at the losses and that, you know, were creation in, in the case of the Netherlands, it does not get anywhere close to uh, that 10%. You get what I'm point. So we, you can't even trust the numbers that they, they are giving out because 9 billion out of uh, 8 or something billion is just about 1%. But because they got eight percent of GDP losses, they have to bump up the, the Dutch losses, the, the Dutch central bank's losses, to eleven percent to look as if their eight percent is not as bad. So those kind of things I don't think a central bank should do. If the Dutch central bank's losses are one percent of GDP and yours are, is eight percent of GDP, accept that your losses are eight times that of the Dutch central bank, and therefore there's a problem. And try and explain it. Don't just fudge the numbers in an official statement that you release to the public, knowing that analysts like us will look at it very closely. So we now, that was the, the losses of the, on the balance sheet and their profit and, and, and loss statement. We now go into the issue of operational expenses, and I'm only talking now about this, uh, the head office because we don't have time. In the case of the head office, it's very straight. You had the budget. The budget that you had for the project said 80-something billion because you had the negotiations with the uh, public procurement authority, and you accepted that that was the amount that was reasonable. You are still at design stage. While you were still at design stage, the budget had gone to 220 billion. So you had already shown, even before you had started constructing, that your you know the, the, the variation was almost 300 percent. In those kind of circumstances, if you use a normal predictive model for this kind of project cost overrun uh, modeling, you conclude that by the time they are complete, because a lot of variation tends to happen in construction than in design you are going to get like 500% cost overrun. That is the original budget versus how much it actually costs to complete the project is going to be like five times or more what the original budget was. That's not really sound project management. And also we have data in terms of in Ghana, projects of that nature, large scale projects, what are the usual overruns? And Ghana is pretty bad. There's no doubt about it. We tend to um, um, spend way more than we be budget on, on public projects. But even so, the average is about 75%. So if we, we take the 500% possibility, which is that the project is going to cost $400 million instead of the $80 million that, it, $80 million that was budgeted for, we are talking of almost 500% cost overrun versus the average in Ghana around 75%. That is massive. And this is a central bank that is supposed to manage money and therefore have extraordinary skill sets in how you manage projects and all of that. Then we come back to the issue around whether or not we should be building something that's massive anyway. This is going to be twice the size of Terminal 3. Central bank um, needs for, for, for offices don't dramatically expand from year to year. Why is it that you need a building that is the size of two times Ghana's biggest airport terminal? Then they say, oh, well, but the average cost is $2,000 per square meter. And $2,000 per square meter is below the average for Ghana for prestige high-rise projects. Essentially, skyscrapers, big, tall buildings in Ghana, um, average, on average, cost about $2,700 uh, uh, $2, square meters. So if we are doing $2,000 per square meter, that is not too bad. Well, it depends on which uh, uh, intelligence database you use. We are using the African Construction and uh, Property uh, Cost Guide. You can use that, look at an actual there, and that is managed primarily by academics. Is the University of Stellenbosch. You can look at data from actual consultants like RLB, and you find out that uh, RLB data shows that in Ghana, actually, they cost about thousand four hundred dollars. 
So they look for the source that has a higher amount and they use that source to justify it. But if you let's accept that source, which this is the source that they are using, the African Property and Construction Cost Guide source. And let's take the $2,700. Even so, it's still misleading because what they've done is that they've taken the the fact, uh, the line item for uh, high prestige high rights uh, uh, offices, which is $2,720, and then pretend as if the entire project is the office tower. So the, if you map it, then you say, okay, it's true. But when you look at the actual breakdown of the project, the high rise tower, the prestige high rise tower, is about 40% of the gross project, right? Because you have other pro uh, elements of that project. So when you look at it, what's the actual percentage of the high rise, you get to about 40%. And if you do a weighted average, you get to about $1,600, which is significantly lower than what it, uh, uh, is budgeted for for this building. But that's not what worries most people. What worries most people is the procurement abuse. The fact that they decided, even though this was such an expensive project, not to use competitive tendering, open it up, let people come and bid all across the country and then look for the best pricing. They decided that, no, they were going to select a number of companies and then choose one. That is not sensible, in my view, given the, the scale of the project. They say, oh, no, because we did that because of national security. And national security means we can't open it to everybody to come and bid. But you can open it to a lot of people to come and bid and then use your national security lenses. We don't believe in national security excuse because of simple things like the fact that they have a lot of other issues in procurement where they prefer single sourcing and restricted tendering than competitive tendering as a, not, as a, as a standard behavior. So you look at their, 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 their complexes that they are built, the guest house complexes in Takrade and Tamale. And what you find is that there was a company that had been awarded the project, Maripoma. They come in and they hunt Maripoma out and bring in the sea money through really shady circumstances that leads to Maripoma taking them um, to the tribunal. And the fact of the matter is that they, they, they try to suggest that Maripoma got some loans from some of the banks that had collapsed in ways that really suggested that uh, Mr. Ali, Ali Seydu was being hounded because of the fact that the project, they wanted to take the project from uh, Maripoma and give it to the Simoni. And they've done that for both of the, the major guest houses, which cost millions and millions of dollars. And we know there have been cost variations from the original spending. So at all national security, what is it that Maripoma had in the Bank of Ghana regime that before they existed, which was national security compliant, that when you come in, it's no longer national security compliant and only the Simoni can match. Think of the, the, the cars they buy which they buy from the likes of Auto Dream and Jimotech. They've spent millions of dollars buying Toyota vehicles, Mercedes-Benz and things like that from these companies. Jimotech alone uh, from the last couple of years, millions of dollars. Now all of it, single sourcing and restricted tendering. What is national security by a Toyota or a Mercedes-Benz? Why must you use restricted tendering and single sourcing to buy Toyota vehicles and Mercedes-Benz? What, what, how do you justify that Jimotech it has some national security clearance that requires you to buy the cars from them in, in, in that fashion. So it tells you that it's not about national security, it's about their natural practice. When we look at the data in terms of procurement, the central bank in recent years, you find out that over 90% of general routine procurement is happening through restricted tender and single source. Even when they are buying a forklift to go and leave the currency that they move across the country, they use single source. And, so, and don't think it's always been like this. This is an advert from 2010 where the Bank of Ghana is publishing in the national dailies its procurement plan and inviting people to bid all over the place. The argument is that it's just their nature of their procurement practice. It's a culture there that is currently seriously hampering their cost efficiency and it's got nothing whatsoever to do with national security. Because it can't be that national security is the reason for all of these single sourcing and restricted tendering. That's just the way you behave. So it's not surprising that for this building, you use the same approach as well. Thank you.